And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the special Pride Month edition of Community Conversations on Race, in which we will be talking specifically about LGBTQ issues and the intersection of LGBTQ issues and race, race issues, and all of the current issues that live underneath that intersection. My name is Jessie Hankins. My pronouns are she and her. I am the Program and Evaluation Manager for LGBTQ Connection, and tonight I'm the moderator for this beautiful panel that we have tonight. We're going to start off by having our panelists introduce themselves, and Carrie, can we start off with you? Um, I'm Carrie Rigo, she, her. I am a local business owner. I am also a lecturer at Sonoma State University, Santa Rosa Junior College, and um, just really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Carrie. Next, we'll go to M. Um, hi, my name is Emerson Robles Tuttle, uh, or M. Uh, I use they/them pronouns. I am uh, first-generation Filipino mixed American. Um, uh, I identify as queer and non-binary. Um, I graduated from Sonoma State um, with a liberal studies degree in 2019, and uh, I've been working with local activists for the last year now. So, thank you for having me. Thank you, Em. Sarah, we'll go to you next. My name is Sarah. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I am having an echo, I think. Uh, sorry. Um, I am non-binary, uh, mixed uh, Asian race, uh, child of immigrants, a lot of things, um, and a community organizer. I've been uh, doing organizing for the past uh, five years or something. Um, since 2016 and I'm excited to be here uh gender queerness all of that is kind of this is my nerd zone welcome to the nerd zone I think we all belong here <laughs> Johnny we'll go to you last thanks hi my name is Johnny Nolan I use he and they pronouns um I am the sitting president of the board uh I Community Action Partnership Sonoma right now, and also I work in the cannabis industry at a little fancy extraction plant called The Resourcery, which is largely queer owned and operated. Um, and I'm super excited to come back to the Community Conversations on Race as a panelist this time. Jesse, may I, may I add one detail? I got so excited I forgot to tell you how I identify. Um, I am a, a woman that is black and white, so I'm of mixed heritage, and, and um, I'm also pansexual and identify as queer. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll have a, a bit more to share about your identities in just a moment. I just wanted to share a few, um, few make a few statements before we start. First, I just want to make it clear that everyone on this panel is speaking from their own experience and perspectives. In no way does any one person on this panel represent the LGBTQ community as a whole. We're all coming in with our own unique perspectives. No one speaks for the whole community. Um, if we have time at the end, we will take questions from the audience, although we have lots of juicy topics to talk about today. So I cannot promise that, but we encourage questions and we hope that we will have time to get to them at the end. And lastly, I just wanted to say a little bit about pronouns. As you noticed, I think everyone here introduced themselves with their name and pronouns. Pronouns are one of the simplest way that you can validate someone's identity in the LGBTQ community. And it's also one of the simplest ways that you can be an ally and show your support for LGBTQ people by not only respecting their pronouns, but being aware of your own pronouns and normalizing the use of introducing yourself with your pronouns, of sharing them in things like your Zoom name, such as we all have, or your email signature. And so, for example, when we're talking with our panelists tonight, if I'm talking about Sarah, I would say they have a great haircut and I'm going to refer to them in just a moment. And if I was talking about Carrie, I would say she has a really lovely pin on today. And if I was talking about Johnny, I might say he has a great beard and I just talked to them a little while ago. So those are some examples of how we use pronouns. We know that um, it can be a little bit confusing if you're not used to, to using them regularly for folks, um, but we do ask that you respect our panelists' pronouns tonight. And if you do get someone's pronouns wrong, 
it's not a gigantic deal. You're not going to be fired, but we are just going to, we, we will try to correct you just because it's always a learning moment for everyone. Uh, and I'm going to include in the chat here, which will be shared on the Facebook chat, just a, a link to a little bit more about pronouns for anyone that would like to learn more on that specific topic. And with all that said, I think we're going to get into our first question. So I said we'd be talking a bit more about identity first. So I'd love to hear from our panelists. Um, what parts of your identity are important to you and how have they changed over time? And M, we'll go and start with you. Awesome. Um, so I identify as a first generation mixed Filipino American queer non-binary. Um, in the past, um, I've identified as just white um, not really believing that my Asian identity was um, enough uh, to claim as a part of myself. Um, I've also identified as straight and then bisexual and then pansexual, um, really trying to figure out if I was attracted to these people or if I really wanted to be them. And that really made me question why I was identifying as a cisgender male. Um, and I was caught up in believing that I was restricted to being a boy and fulfilling that role based on what a, um, what a doctor said when I was born. Um, but, uh, you know, now I, um, now I identify as queer and non-binary. And what I like about queer is that it's an umbrella term that kind of encompasses um, all sexualities and attraction-based identities, um, which I felt was also one of the goals of the rainbow flag. Um, being a symbol that all of us can find a kind of find ourselves within. Um, and you know, I um, I wrote down notes about my own identity. <laughs> uh, what I, I what, what I love about uh, non-binary is the freedom. Um, I'm not restricted to one of two options that were presented to me. Um, I can present masculine, I can present feminine, and it doesn't define who I am as a person. Um, and you know, together, um, all of my identities to me mark my progress in kind of decolonizing myself, um, breaking free from what I was told I am and the expectations that followed. Um, being non-binary is an active state of defiance um, against assimilation. Um, it's the acknowledgement uh, of the many genders that have historically existed um, in non-Western cultures. So that's me. Thank you so much, Em. Next, we'll go to Sarah. Um, I love that. Yeah, that's very much uh, a lot that I agree with um, or resonate with. I, over the past like couple of years, have really started kind of identifying as a misfit. Uh, I really love uh, Martin Luther King. One of his last speeches talked about being maladjusted. Like this world is messed up. And we shouldn't be adjusted to it. Uh, and being non-binary, mixed race, child immigrants, all neurodivergent, all of these different things, um, you know, to me represents sort of an identity version of not being adjusted to the world as it is. Uh, like I don't fit. And when I was younger, that was really, really hard. That was really lonely. But as an adult, as an organizer, as somebody who you know, wants to be part of changing the world and making it better. I love being a misfit. And I think that is uh, a lot of just like what I lean into as, as far as identity goes. I know last, last time I talked about being mixed race and that's like just so much a part of it. Um, but yeah, just like the world as it is didn't have space for me. Uh, and so I embraced being a misfit. Hmm. I love that, thank you. And Johnny, we'll go to you next. Awesome. So I really love that uh, identity as a misfit. I think that's a good, if I had to choose a singular um, word to sum it all up. But um, so my sort of blockchain of identity that I've come up with is I identify as a pagan punk rock social justice advocate gamer and environmentalist. Um, and it's, you know, something that I like to think about is that identity is impermanence and that we all change and evolve over time and that we as like um, American consumerist culture has trained us to think a lot about 
our identity is defined as like what job we have and what things we consume. And even those things change over time. You know, you say I'm a baker, but are you for a baker forever? Were you a baker when you were born? Are you going to be a baker on the last day of your life? So I like the fluidity of identity and the opportunity that opens up to, you know, um, become whatever you want to be at any point in time. And to me, that's a lot of what freedom is, is we're fighting for the freedom of identity. So I um, sexually identify as gay and queer. I also use the term queer and LGBTQ plus interchangeably, which I know is a, a point of contention, mostly with some older folks. Um, and sorry, but not sorry about that. I kind of like having a punk rock reclaimed term that really pulls all the different letters together under one banner, where sometimes I feel like the letters either exclude or divide or, or whatever, it's, it's separate definitions. And so one word together, I feel like really reflects better the way I feel with our community. Um, I think as far as shifting identity over time too, um, for me, I have um, observed and participated in identity shift growing up a white man, both in progressive California and also for a long time in rural conservative South and spending my time learning to understand what that means and then spending really the rest of my life trying to deconstruct that so I can better understand other perspectives and learn to be a better ally for all of my non-white, non-male, non-heteronormative friends and loved ones and community members. And it's like a forever process of unlearning and relearning who you are and what society has taught us that may or may not be correct. Um, and similarly, exploring maleness and what impact that identity has had on society and the people that I care about. And so one of the, the, uh, the impetus to explore the he and they pronouns is I don't really enjoy participating in the male gender. I have a lot of outward masculine expression features like my beard and stuff, but I personally prefer a they, them pronoun because it's, you know, um, it's been sort of weaponized and I don't enjoy being part of that weaponized oppressive majority. I only really like to wield it when I can use it to support others or sort of further progress a progressive political agenda. And the gay agenda? <laughs> Specifically <laughs> gay luxury communists. <laughs> Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, and last we'll go to Carrie. I'm so glad I'm last because you guys, I just really love being queer. I just, all of you, you're just, every single one, just in your introductions, I'm like, these people are wicked awesome. So <clears throat> just completely grew up in the queer community. And funny thing is, is Johnny, you mentioned the word queer itself. It has a lot of baggage. And I'm also a black person. I don't feel the same way about the n-word as I feel about the word queer and for me it just brings joy um, and it makes me happy and I'm a Q my maiden name maybe that has something to do with it my maiden start my main name starts with Q so all things Q I think are awesome it just there's just no question so I think that's why okay um so I'm half black and half white and I grew up in Santa Rosa so and I've always been a misfit. I just use the word weird, which I also really like, Sarah. So, um, but I like your version too. I'll start using that as well. Yes. God, I, I'm, <laughs> so I'm a trained actress and that means um, I know how to lie and I know how to shape shift. And um, so I'm, I'm now in social media professionally. I just kept on the same path. Um, ultimately I've learned how to go into rooms and shape shift and mm -hmm. to code switch and um, have been able to do that in so many environments and I've done it for so long that it was I uh, identified as bisexual from 16 all the way until I was almost 40 and then I read the definition of pan and before right before I had read it I had to look at it a few different times but um I remember thinking to myself, I don't understand the feeling of pride. I don't feel it. And I was like, am I missing it? And I was like looking at the rainbow flag, but everything's gray. I felt colorblind. And then um, when I read the definition of pan, I didn't get it. And then I read it again and I was like, wait a minute. And it made sense. And somebody turned all the color on. And I was maybe 38 and I was like, I get it. I get it. I see it. All of it. So 
um, I late in life have a sense of pride I just didn't have before. I was just a part of the family, raised around drag queens, raised around people that were trans, people that were non-binary. We used the word androgynous when I was growing up and nobody had ever said anything about like David Bowie or Freddie Mercury or like Elton John, like nobody was talking about like Joan Jett. Like why, were no, why was nobody talking about these people? It wasn't until uh, non-binary popped up that like all of the pieces started to make sense. Mm. So I'm an excitable person if you haven't noticed um, and I'm a teacher. So I spend a lot of time talking about pronouns, Jesse, in my college classes. I talk about it in advertising. I talk about it. My most popular blog of all time, how to hide your birthday on Facebook. Number two is how to change your gender on Facebook. <laughs> so that's, I guess, my identity. I never had one. <laughs> Wait, a Facebook? Yeah, and I never had a, a, a gender on, on Facebook. So I, I joined when it was like blank, you could just uh -huh. leave it blank, and mm -hmm. I just left it nice. <laughs> the entire time. I now have 56 genders, yeah, <sighs> which makes me very happy. So I love to talk about that in my classes and then force people to think about just these very first things that people are faced with when they open a door, they have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. So I like to talk about that. Right. Yeah. Thank you all so much for those beautiful answers. I mean, just such a reflection of you know, not only just the fluidity that exists within our sexuality and our sense of gender, but just how, how over time we know ourselves differently and just what an amazing and incredible time to be alive it is right now where we have so much more language to understand, our, understand these parts of ourselves. Um, and, you know, just how important it is to accept people's changing identities through time and that we try on different terms. They work for us at different times. We learn new terms. They work better. Uh, I'm going to make a motion to add an M onto LGBTQ for Misfit. So thanks for that, Sarah. <laughs> LGBTQM. Why not? Vote right here. <laughs> I mean, Stonewall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia. That's true. And that, thank you for that segue, Sarah, into our next question, <laughs> in which we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the history of this month, which is Pride Month, queer liberation as we know it. Um, where did it come from? Why is it this month? So we're going to we're going to dive, put on our history nerd glasses now, all of us, um, and we're going to start with Carrie. Tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what is Pride? Why does Pride Month exist? Why did it start? So I'm literal. So I'm going to go back to the literal thing that I think of as the spark um, for pride. And for um, my, and again, this is just my own way of telling the story. So anybody else might tell this differently because it's such a big, big story. Anyway, the impetus um, for Pride Month and the pride movement, the way we know it today, I think starts from the Stonewall Inn. Is it Stonewall Inn, Sara? Did I get the name right? I just know Stone, Stonewall. Uh, there, by the way, my head. <laughs> there is a there is a fictionalized version of Stonewall on Netflix. Don't watch it. It's a waste oh. of your time. Okay. So this is um, a bar and it's a bar where um, all kinds of people can be, um, particularly uh, men in drag, right? So uh, gay people, all kinds of um, can go in and out. Anyway, long history of harassment from law enforcement. Um, rounded up people, taken to jail, uh, vandalized, assaulted, like the whole works. So um, one day it was enough. And Marsha P. Johnson, who is an angel in our community, literally and figuratively, um, is uh, the person that is ascribed to have picked up a brick and thrown it at a police officer. And then you have a riot. Um, and the Stonewall riots is what we know, um, which for a while I think was known as had a Liberation Day to it, Christopher Street Liberation Day. I believe it was on Christopher Street, I think I'm right. Um, so anyway, um, I think the riot went on like for three days. So um, this was probably not the only episode of violence, but this is a very well known as a spark for um, current day pride, which I'm sure Sarah has more information than I do. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, let's, let's turn to Sarah next. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think one thing that happens in our communities, we tend to like characterize stone the Stonewall riots as like the start of a movement. Um, and yeah, I, I like that it being like a spark. I think of it as like a turning point. Um, like there's that phrase, uh, Stonewall was a riot. And I love that. Uh, I think it kind of, uh, you know, sort of mythologizes Stonewall as like this uh, like thing that is, you know, it was like, it, it was a thing that happened. It was really important. Um, and I think of it as being sort of like the, the, the moment we like collectively remembered that we can fight back. And that's what it represents. And that's why I think it's like an important uh, moment in history to celebrate is that remembrance. Um, but the reason I say it's like a remembering is that there's actually like a lot of history of like queer resistance and, uh, and queer liberation prior to 1969 that I think, uh, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, the general public just sort of thinks that uh, the queers appeared in 1969. <laughs> But um, one of my favorite historical figures is a person named uh, William Dorsey Swan, and I strongly uh, <laughs> like suggest looking this person up. They were I'm going to use they because uh, I don't we don't know, um, but they were the first person that we know of to describe themselves as a queen of drag. Uh, they started the first drag balls uh, in D.C. Um, I forget if I mentioned they were a former slave, and I think that's a really important thing for us to, like, be aware of as far as, like, queer liberation actually comes from, like, the intersection of, uh, you know, queer liberation and Black liberation. Like, those are not separable. Um, and there was actually, like, a sort of similar moment in D.C., with William Dorsey Swan to the Stonewall riots where the drag ball that they were putting on was raided by police. And also similarly, uh, they fought. And uh, there's this uh, sort of iconic description of uh, the police like storm their way in and uh, Swan just like stands up and points at them and is just like, you is no gentleman. And then they brawled. Um, so as far as like the character of, uh, queer liberation, there's, there's a certain consistency. Thank you, Sarah. And Em, we'll go to you next for this question. Yeah. Um, you know, something that strikes me, um, is that in every queer historical text, um, that mentions Stonewall, um, the phrase routine police raid is used. And, you know, when I first, on, upon like first reading about like queer history, I, um, I didn't really bat an eye to it, but as it kept appearing, it just, um, it really makes you think about like why the, I'm trying to be polite, um, how, he being polite. <laughs> <laughs> how shitty it is um, that they have to routinely do these things um, because the the violations and um, the violations that uh, were in place then um, and the laws that we were breaking then were things like um, two men and two women they couldn't they couldn't dance with each other you know um, uh, an establishment couldn't um, knowingly sell liquor to a known homosexual. Um, and or even um, what what was the other one? Um, three three pieces of uh, of clothing um, of the of the wrong gender. If you were caught wearing it, um, they were all means for arrest. Um, and, you know, I I I don't want to say that um, we haven't made any progress in that because these are things that are. Or I don't want to say we haven't made any progress in terms of like. Um, uh, how routine police raids are. Um, I'm, I don't want to say that they, they don't happen now. I think it's a lot less frequent. Um, but it's just 
the coming from someone on the later end of millennial or the very, very early start of Gen Z, it is quite wild to me um, that these were even things in place. Um, you know, and also I have a, I have a quote to um, uh, just in, in regards to Stonewall um, by um, novelist uh, John Recchi, uh, R-E-C-H-Y, um, where he stated, um, overemphasis on that single event distorts our history and renders as lesser other acts of equal and even greater courage when circumstances of the time of occurrence are considered. Um, and so, you know, it's because we're in the North Bay, I don't think we've mentioned Compton's Cafeteria yet. Have we mentioned the Tenderloin? <laughs> we haven't really talked about San Francisco yet. Um, just um, Compton's Cafeteria was, um, uh, there was another raid that took place before Stonewall. There were events that took place before Stonewall and Stonewall is seen and often referred to just as Stonewall. And that is the, that it was the turning point. And I do want to acknowledge that um, the raid, um, the raid at Stonewall um, that week, um, which was the second one within that week, um, did uh, garner like the, the most noise um, in terms of uh, queer liberation um, and active fighting against the system. Um, but there were a lot more events that took place prior um, to Stonewall. I don't want to diminish the work that folks did um, then in New York, but uh, just, you know, uh, acknowledging, acknowledging the events that took place prior. Um, that quote was like a much more eloquent version of what I was saying earlier, <laughs> so thank you. I know, um, I, I was thinking about it as you said it. As far as a spark is concerned, um, I, I very, I'm a person of color. Um, so I think I see massive parallels between the death and murder of George Floyd or George, ugh, George Floyd, am I getting his name right? I don't know why my brain lost it. Okay, so his death, um, it was a spark. Mm -hmm. It all was a spark. It's also from a marketing and branding perspective. That's my specialty. It's a known name. What's fascinating about it, particularly when you have um, young people in the LGBTQ community that don't know a lot of history because it's like we were young, we learn as we go every day, um, is to spend a tremendous amount of time leapfrogging from topic to topic. Like William Swan, such a great story. I love that story. And there's photography of him as well, them. Thank you for making that suggestion, Zara. Um, but history is really, really important. And it's not that the history doesn't exist, it's that it's very hard to access. Mm -hmm. So Stonewall is an opening in the wall for people to, to open the doors and be able to see so much. So M had fantastic uh, mentions of other issues. So I like to say the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd, very similar to Stonewall and the queer liberation movement. But I just think of it as just a, um, a hole where people can see through and all of a sudden they can see there's mm -hmm. all of this stuff here. So as we keep talking, and by the way, if you haven't noticed in the chat section, we're putting resources in there to leapfrog from topic to topic. So that yeah, makes a great point. Yeah. History is a lot more interesting when you get away from the like very uh, dominant culture, cis heteronormative stuff. It's there's some there's some fun stories out there. Yeah, that's the best parts of history. Yeah. Um, something else I want to bring back that um, um, talked about that like a lot of times, especially it's easy in this modern era is to forget that they they threw the brick at Stonewall because it was illegal to be gay. You know, like now we've reached such progress legally that, you know, we could walk outside and drag or with a, a, a pride flag on our shirt and was like much, like much more confidently and less fears. It's still illegal to be gay in 72 countries. Right. And so, you know, you think about um, queer activism and riots and they happened before Stonewall. They've happened since Stonewall there's a whole string of really awesome stories going on there. And, you know, also we talk locally, um, the, the Battle of San Francisco that they call that when 
um, after the assassination of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone, when the queer community rioted from Castro up to City Hall and tore the city apart. And then the police rioted back in just like unfettered violence against the gay community. And it was an incredible multi-day event that also it peaked a lot of social consciousness and people saw it happen. And at that time, that looked like police brutality. You know, then the news covered, look at these police beating up uh, gay people who just had their, their big elected civic leader assassinated. Um, and so for me, talking about pride, it's a celebration of this continuous stream of activism and protest and resistance and defiance and revolution and self-creation that we've been that we get to be a part of now it's new fronts you know and we we have the history that some of us were alive for the aids activists in the, in the 80s when queer folk were experiencing an exterminating event and politicians at the time were ignoring it ignoring our undesirable community as we rapidly died and we have community villains like the reagans that became sort of avatars of how cold and uncaring the government had been towards us and it took massive protests all over the country to raise awareness of what was happening and to pressure politicians and the FDA to make, to make action so that we could survive. And, you know, I, um, I always loved the visuals of the ACT UP die-ins where hundreds and hundreds of queer folk laying with tombstone, cardboard cut out tombstones that said killed by Reagan's inaction, killed by the FDA, um, that brought all the attention and, and helped to like push um, research and release of drugs forward so that the community could survive. And, you know, we look also, it continues that we have had a major victory more recently with the um, Marriage Equality Act. And it just continues forward as we continue to like spread freedom and safety for queer folk all around the world on all kinds of different fronts. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I think we just got into a lot of really important points in LGBTQ history. And, you know, a common theme here has been, you know, from William, uh, William Darcy, Dorsey Swan to Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. Um, you know, so many of the first people to push back and, and really um, be part of that spark were queer and trans people of color. Right. And and yet still we have, you know, today in 2021, the a higher murder rate for black trans women than we did two years ago in 2019. And and this is a very real issue still in our community. Um, so let's let's transition now to talking about this, to talking about whiteness in queer spaces, colorism in queer spaces, and how what does decentering whiteness in queer spaces look like? and how do we get there? And for this question, I'm gonna to turn to our panelists of color first to give them the space to respond, but I just really wanna make clear that it is not, we are not putting this on the folks of color to solve this. This is, this is white folks issue to address, but I just wanna give um, our folks of color on this call today the space to respond first. And Sara, would you like to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, actually, like hearing, uh, like I know about this, like the the AIDS crisis in the um, uh, there's a documentary called How to Survive a Plague, and it made me cry. Um, that's not that hard. Uh, but the the like this sort of like systematic, uh, you know, destruction of queer people, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, squash out queerness in a way, uh, has like a history as well. Um, and that history is really, really deeply intertwined with colonialism. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people know this. Uh, there was a Mexican Inquisition, also a Philippine Inquisition. Um, and those two institutions were really centered around uh, trying to wipe out uh, homosexuality. That was like the goal of those two inquisitions. Um, and, you know, so I, th I think of like all the, the different sort of like ways in which we have historically like fought back. It's also like a very like 
fighting against the colonizers kind of uh, story as well. Um, and I think for me, like holding that uh, reality, the history of how we ended up with such a homophobic, transphobic, modern day uh, world, how uh, homophobia and transphobia got to those other countries where it's illegal to be gay. Um, you know, I think that's a, like a really important thing to remember. Um, the binary is actually like a new thing. That was a thing that was um, brought by the colonizers uh, to everywhere that they invaded. Uh, and was talking earlier about how, um, uh, you know, cultures around the world have uh, you know, queerness uh, recognized. They have names for, uh, you know, different genders. There's a people in, uh, on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia that recognizes five genders. I might be related to them. Um, and I think like a lot of decentering whiteness is an embrace, embracing of like queerness, uh, the, um stuff we were talking like at the, the beginning of this the, the like the um disruption of cultural norms in general i think is a way of of uh decentering whiteness um when i think about it like whiteness is really a lot about uh conformity uh colonialism they really like in all of these colonial places, they really used the binary, they used cis heteronormativity, they cut the hair of native uh, folks to force them to like conform to uh, a European cis heteronormative standard. And, and so like, to me, a lot of like, uh, a lot of our job is to uh, identify what those things are, uh, what sort of things were, uh, buried by by whiteness and by colonizing, um, and and so forth. Um, I mean, to me, like a lot of it is just cultural. I know that there's a lot of uh, you know work around uh, you know changing who is centered, and I think that's important too. Um, but I think disrupting the binary, <laughs> disrupting um, the culture, is is something that we we have to also incorporate. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Carrie. Um, so I'm going to talk about it in a really practical sense, um, just to completely change the the I don't know vibe. <laughs> sort of super like a word my kid would say. I'm going to change my vibe. Okay. So um, I'm going to look at the, the, the practical. I'm going to talk about it in two different ways. I spent a lot of time in boardrooms and a lot of time in corporate in environments where I'm always the only woman of color. I'm generally, if my gator is working, the only queer person in the room, um, maybe not, but still pretty close. And I'm used to being the only one. And um, so when I'm in a room and we talk about committee chair, we talk about who's a good person for that, which call it, which call it. And I look at who they choose and I always go, really? A white man? Sorry, this is going on in my head. Or I read the North Bay Business Journal's top businesses of the year. Or I see the top 100 women in business in the North Bay Biz Magazine. I sent uh, letters to both of those editors do you realize you have no people of color, right? So that kind of thing. I will call it on the map right there in the boardroom. So um, I spend a tremendous amount of time saying, um, who's, let's look around and who's missing from this table. I don't see anybody with a disability. I don't see mm -hmm. anybody of color. I don't see any non-binary people. I see, so I will call any category that I don't see. And i am reached the age in my life where I don't give a crap if somebody looks at me sideways. Tell me that that's not an issue. Okay, so then here's the other way I look at this. Um, I'm a person of, um, when I, I wanna influence other people to change their thought process. 
So we are watching a movie. We are talking about what movie we want to watch as friends, as people, whatever. And I'll be like, oh my God, is that another version of Hamlet? That's the 28th version of Hamlet I've seen in the last three years. I love Shakespeare, fantastic. But can we focus on a different writer, please? Can we get away from Emma and Jane Austen and Little Women? I want to see possibly in the Heights. I'd like some more Afro-Latinx people though. Right? Crazy rich Asians only put dark skinned Asians in scary security roles. So there's always the opportunity to say, hey, I'd love to watch it, but you know what? I don't need another version of Shakespeare. I would like a writer of color. I would like a queer writer. I would like, let's explore other projects. There are other opportunities out there, but I'm just really tired of the same five stories over and over and over again. So I will ask the people around me in the option, let's choose to decenter, whether it's in a boardroom or it's on my Netflix queue. Um, I have a lot of different ways that I do that. And usually for me, it's, I, I lean over and be like, Psst, do you realize there are very few women on this board of directors? Mm -hmm. Oh, I count, <laughs> I count. And then I send an email. And then I have some, some suggestions. There's, I don't know if any of y'all would have seen it, but there is a meme out there somewhere of like all of the uh, DVD covers of um, Christmas movies. <laughs> and they're like exactly the same. They are completely the same. Generic white guy, generic white woman, um, the same outfits even like just about the same colors everything about it is there's so many stories out there there's so many people to pay attention think, like, to and pay yeah, attention to the same yeah. 10 people for the last 500 years Come on. And I, I, yeah and i think that's like where what i was saying and like the practicality that you bring to it like really converge just like disrupt those norms like you know add the newness to it like add uh not newness but like different you know the stop doing the same boring thing for us it's a lot i i loved what both of y'all had to say and for love for for um for us specifically too it's um we're more likely to recognize it too um because we're the ones not being represented we're the ones not seeing mm -hmm. ourselves out on the board of directors. We're not seeing each other out um, on in Hollywood, you know? Um, it's gotten uh, better, I don't know. I'm hesitant to say it, um, but just uh, part of what we need from white folks is for them to, you know, remove themselves from the situation and really look at the entire, the entire picture of, is this, the exact retelling of Hamlet. Um, are we is, but with a whole different cast, just told in a different way, in an exotic setting. Is it, um, you know, I, the things that you do, would we have been able to do them? You know, it's 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 as basic as that. Even, um, you know, the, um, I wanted to talk more about um, uh, Sarah. You. You brought up colonialism and imperialism, and they, um, you know, uh, something that I thought about going into this uh, conversation too was, um, you know, uh, oftentimes we hear critiques of how we always make things about race, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the and how that's the biggest gaslight um, ever created yeah, because <laughs> it was colonizing systems and imperial systems um, that created this whole, um, James Baldwin called it the lie. And it was just that um, uh, you're different from us, but we're better than you. So we're going to oppress you and assimilate you. And I was in preparing for this talk too, I went through a bunch of my old texts from Sonoma State and just, um, there's, uh, there's a story of um, a man from Uganda um, who came here and he worked with, um, I believe it was um, just just queer folks in general. And as he got here, he wouldn't have been able to go back to his home country because they, um, because uh, 
homosexuality is illegal there, right? And they, and so he now had to seek asylum in the US. And luckily he did, but the, the fact is that um, Uganda didn't originally have that law in place. It was because they got colonized by Britain um, and they imposed all of these rules, all of these social rules that you weren't allowed to um, love somebody of the same gender or the same sex. You couldn't, um, you know, the, the same reasons that folks here were getting arrested for. Um, and now he couldn't go back. I don't know if he has been able to, I haven't followed up on the story, but just um, it, when folks say that, um, when folks say that we, when people of color make things all about race, that is, that is the most hypocritical thing they could possibly say. Um, yeah. It, it's the same thing in Malaysia too, actually. It's like the, it was like a British colony and it now has anti-sodomy laws that came from the Brits. Yeah. Like literally it's, it, they're still on the books from British colonialism there. Uh, you know, like we, I really do think that the, like the struggle for queer liberation is like, like basically the same as like decolonization. Like, I think that those are the same thing. Um, and I, I definitely feel like, like the sort of efforts to like, uh, make acceptable or to like whitewash or sanitize pride is kind of a kind of so like cultural appropriation and we're gonna get into pride and that exact topic on our next question um i before i oh. defer to johnny though i was i just was curious if any of y'all wanted to say anything more specifically about colorism and how that shows up in lgbtq spaces Oh gosh, like if, if we go into like the, the the actual like concrete instances of where where we see it, it's like we'll be here all night. <laughs> um but like we're subject like I, I say that like those fights are the same, but also like we're subject to the same uh sort of like <laughs> white supremacist culture seeping into our like understandings of the world and ourselves. Um I know that I get treated differently in the winter than I do in the summer in any space, but including queer spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You two, any, either of you want to add something or you want me to go to Johnny and then come back to you? I don't think I'm okay. <laughs> um, I need what Johnny has to say. Yeah, go ahead, Johnny. All right. Um, so for me, and sort of um, drawing back on what you brought up, M, the sort of colonial white narrative that has marched itself across almost the entire globe. And what I try and remind myself and sort of like a constant process even to be learning it and integrating it in my own mindset and personality. And also, as my family and friends will tell you, I exhaustively remind them as well, <laughs> is did like reject the white narrative, even if you're white, um, reject the white male default of everything. And that the white supremacy of our culture has programmed all of our brains um, to assume that white whiteness is the default and anything else requires a label. So, you know, you see a news article that says black mayor does this thing. You, you wouldn't see a news article that says white male do this or, or male mayor does this thing so you know like it's pervasive in our media and the way that information is being fed to us and constantly reinforcing that sort of mindset that we grew up with and so part of what i try and do is like you know the privilege of being a white man to say something like that that is not me making it about race it's talking about a topic and so that's one of the good things about being in the oppressive majority is i I can actually get some of these messages through to people that wouldn't listen to a person of color. But sometimes it feels like hitting people over the head with a pan over and over again, being like, stop listening to the white narrative, stop reinforcing white supremacy all the time with everything that you participate in and entertainment and leisure and stuff like that. 
Um, and it's difficult, you know, because we're programmed as children to think this way, and it's hard to break out of, and it's hard even to think about what the alternative is, because it's, it's like a fundamental baseline social programming. And uh, something that, in my experience, um, that that is manifested in is, like, and, um, like, honestly, it's been really disappointing to me to see in the past few years how many of my um, white gay dudes that I know on Facebook or from my time living in San Francisco, et cetera, have gotten their marriage equality and then they're done and they haven't raised a finger or a voice or even a hashtag or share a simple meme or anything to support. Went back to brunch. Yeah, went back to brunch. And so BLM <laughs> is like, that's not my fight, you know? And I just get so red in the face when I hear people say stuff like that because it's absolutely the same fight. The civil rights movements are so connected and we, it's not time to rest on our laurels. It was never about how do we win gay rights for white men. It was always about how do we win identity freedom and justice for all people. So I, um, I like to remind myself also, and I, I think about the, I thought about this a lot preparing for this panel is that originally um, the gay pride parade as it like went into different cities was called gay freedom parade it, it wasn't even inclusive of lesbian let alone uh, like bisexual transgender queer anything like that stuff has gathered on over the years and a lot more recently and everything and even the planning and control and financing and and who was in the front of parades and where people were and how everyone was represented was really tightly controlled by white men for many many years for decades really and it's something that I'm appreciating as younger generations come in. And I love a lot of the inspiration and creativity and like fearlessness of younger queer generations um, coming in and bringing this air of accountability to the conversation that gay men have to take a step back now and say, you know, like it's time for you to leverage our privilege to support the movement to keep marching forward and bring about justice for everybody or step aside and let someone else take the microphone and spotlight and give them the power to, to, to hold the narrative. And so I, I think um, the future is female, the future is black, the future is brown, the future is native, the future is Asian, the future is Pacific Islander, the future is trans, the future is non-binary. We make statements like this and someone says, well, what about white? The present is white. The future has already got white in it. We don't have to make statements like that. So like to me, decentering whiteness is making statements that are proactive and positive and supportive and inclusive that define the world in a non-default white male narrative. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, I think what you just said is so important as white folks to, you know, ha first have the have the awareness of the privilege that white folks carry even in queer spaces and then to have that discernment to know when to use that privilege and when to step back. And, um, and I think a few of you brought up pride and how that kind of fits into this idea of decentering whiteness. And so we're gonna transition into our next question here um, where we're really looking at this aspect of pride as it's become this kind of celebratory act, right? For some people, it's a party um, you know, as Sarah said, Pride or Stonewall was a riot. Pride initially was a protest, right? And it's not exactly what it looks like today. And at the core of a lot of this issue is this contention between um, folks who are supportive of cops and police officers being a part of Pride and those who feel that they have no place there. Um, and as we kind of talked a bit about the history, hopefully it's clear where that sentiment comes from. Um, and to bring this into context today, uh, the Pride Board of New York City just recently announced a ban on officers participating in their parade until at least 2025. And I also want to point out the shift in leadership that happened to make that decision. The Pride Board is majority folks of color. And a lot of the pushback that's happened since that decision has been white folks and white officers. So this is really sparking a debate that's been going on for many years now, but um, this is, I think, the first major decision. I know Sacramento Pride 
band cops in their parade and then they went back on the offer and um, so it's a very contentious issue within the community and I'd love to hear from our panelists um, your thoughts on this and looks like Sara we're starting with you. I was just thinking like uh, a minute ago I talked about like being uh, you know I experienced being treated differently in the winter when I'm paler and then in the summer when I'm darker um, and like pride really brings that up for me um, when I see cops there because I, I have experienced that where like um, you know like like I've been treated differently by a cop who who saw like a brown person in the summer and then when he saw my ID he was like oh you're fine go ahead and let me off with a warning because it looks white <laughs> Um, and I guess it was like ambiguous enough. <laughs> it was really scary. Um, I don't like having cops at, at like, I mean, at any event that I'm at, let alone um, Pride, which is like, to me, kind of the most anti-cop thing historically. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think that it, it's appropriate for cops to be there. I think that, uh, I remember uh, you, you sent us that uh, that article and the title says something about like gay cops disheartened and I'm just like quit your jobs. <laughs> it's a you know uh, I, have, I have some emotions around that but um, yeah like I don't uh, feel comfortable with with cops being in that space it it's definitely like a uh, less safe space uh, I could probably say more but I think I'm gonna like <sighs> pass it off yeah thank you and I'm gonna go to Carrie next and a follow-up for this if any of you all want to respond is what what do you think needs to happen for that healing to occur could there ever be a future where cops could be a pride and what needs to happen to get there Um, I'm in a funny position because cops don't look at me twice. They just don't. They don't see me as a person of color. I think it's the curly hair. Um, a lot of people see me as not threatening, though they're totally sleeping on what a threat I am. But like, I get like, like how I come across. So I can look at cops and observe them without them even seeing me. Um, so I have that privilege. Um, but ultimately, I don't feel safe. And this reminds me of when I was in high school and you're old enough to recognize a group of boys that you don't want to brush up against, you don't want them to look at you, and cops are, to me, a gang. They're a gang of boys um, with too much power and um, lethal force. And um, I um, <laughs> am a pansexual woman and was in a cis hetero marriage and was married to a white man with blue eyes. And every day when he left the house, I'd be like, he's coming home safe. If anything bad happens, it's his own fault. Like, and my child passes for white. So um, I am fully aware that, that I'm in a safe position, but I still don't feel safe. My instinct tells me they are not okay. Um, and to avoid them at all costs. So um, between them and then the corporations with their big, huge floats and their employee t-shirts, um, I now don't want to go to a big pride. I was at the San Francisco Pride the year that the Marriage Equality Act was signed. And that was a big, amazing party. Like that was so cool, except for the fact that there was no leather, there was no kink. And then there were nothing but Facebook and Safeway employees coordinated t-shirts and then it was every elected official possible and I was like literally I did this 12 times what what where are we yeah. is this pride I don't think I'll ever go back to a metropolitan area again for pride um well I went to San Diego and that one was pretty good but the point is is that it feels a super um it feels like a skittles ad that's what pride <sighs> feels like to me and then, by the way, Skittles took its color away for Pride Month. That makes no sense. I don't understand. Okay, so between Safeway and Google employees and police officers, that's not the Pride I want to go to. 
Mm. That's not what my pride looks like. Mm. Um, Cultural I, appropriation. Right? Like, I, that's, yeah, I feel like I'm a pay less shoe source. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, it'll take a lot of work on the side of law enforcement. I don't think law enforcement as it exists today or in the foreseeable future has the capacity to completely shift itself institutionally. It won't be called law enforcement anymore. Yep. So honestly, I don't, I don't think that those two parties can meet comfortably and safely um, anytime soon. Thank you, Carrie. You know, you just made me think too, I don't know if any of y'all have seen um, on Twitter, there have been people who've been taking the, all the corporations that have their Rainbow Pride logo and showing how much they've donated to um, politicians who are, have, you know, pushed anti-LGBTQ laws forward. It's very interesting and telling. Mm -hmm. Be a total shame if um, that, that advertisement got out and um, we spread that through everyone that was here watching us on the chat, you know? Mm -hmm. um, be an absolute shame. Yeah. <laughs> um, we weigh in, I'll see if I can find a good link to that. Right on. Um, you know, I, um, I acknowledge that I have privilege in that I am a, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of pale um, for, uh, for Asian and I, or I'm a, I'm a lighter skinned Asian and, you know, even, even growing up, I kind of didn't feel like I was Asian. And so I would identify as white sometimes and, um, it made it easy to just not see things. Um, but just a, a lot of my friends um, are, are people of color and uh, they don't feel safe around cops. I don't think I know a single person that feels safe around cops though. And, uh, you know, Carrie, I really loved what you had to say, um, uh, especially regarding like the fact that I don't think law enforcement as it exists today will find a will find a point in recent in recent future um to uh really let um folks of color feel safe at large events like this mm -hmm. um it, it just it i don't think it's going to happen the um it makes me think back to why we were calling for um uh you know the government to to defund the police you know, it, it's not it's not to completely eradicate the police. It's to make it so that if someone's having a mental health crisis, they're not getting a cop sent to them who has a gun. And we don't know what's going to happen. But in most cases, somebody ended up dead. So um, I, I agree with you that I don't think that law enforcement today, as it stands, is going to find a place at Pride anytime soon. Um, I don't think they're going to be called cops. I don't think they're going to be called law enforcement. Um, if there is ever a time when people um, where queer um, people of color feel safe um, going to an event like Pride um, uh, with, with people like that there, I think if we had, you know, I, I think there can be events that take place during, during Pride events that can be um, maybe overstimulating or maybe... Um, uh, activating for a lot of people and maybe having a mental health professional there would help, you know, having, having, a, um, uh, like a mental health crisis center there, um, for folks to go to, or, um, to just talk to, um, if they, if they're, um, not doing all right and they need help, you know, um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't agree. I don't want to see cops at Pride. Um, I don't want to, I don't really want to go to any Pride events, which sucks because, you know, this, um, I, you know, San Francisco's right here. There's a lot of history here. Um, and there's a lot of good people here um, that I know really want to take the time to really celebrate their identities. Um, but it's, it's not going to be at a large corporate sponsored event. Um, and, you know, it makes me think about the the sanitization of pride as well um, because corporate America um, really, you know, we, we live in a, we live in a capitalist um, country and it's um, it, I guess it only made sense 
for them to event once uh, once queerness and and uh, um, transness was um, starting to become normalized for them to try to capitalize on it. Um, but if you're going to effectively monetize pride to market it to consumers, you have to you have to sanitize the event, and uh, that comes in the form of erasing the history of the riots um, it, uh, that ignited the movement, um, and it comes from portraying Pride as a family-friendly event. Um, it's uh, verbally inclusive, but uh, in actuality, it continues to just visually appeal to a white audience. Um, the, and oftentimes, these parades uh, are also not accessible to a lot of people. Um, they, um, they're effectively negating um, the inclusivity that they're advertising. Um, and these corporations too, they'll, they'll advertise themselves as pro-LGBTQ, which it looks like Jesse found um, our little photo that's gonna maybe accidentally go viral, um, who knows? Um, but these, these corporations, they're, they're lacking proper training for inclusivity. Um, they're, uh, they're not diverse in uh, the corporate settings. The boards are not. I'm sure Carrie can attest to that maybe. Um, and they're actively donating to anti-queer organizations. Um, you know, I, I, I think I went, the first time I went to Pride was also 2015, which I think was the year that marriage equality got um, legalized. So I, I don't know, maybe we crossed paths, Carrie. But um, I was a sophomore in high school and I didn't stick around for all too long. But I, just being at the parade, um, it was just businesses. I did, uh, why did Safeway need a float? <laughs> um, why did Target need a float? Google or Facebook or... <sighs> they, that's not who we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. And they're not training their people on uh, how to be respectful to queer folks, how to be inclusive. Um, if somebody, I don't know, that's, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Johnny, we'll hear from you next. Um, yeah, I'm going to piggyback on that rainbow capitalism before I get to the police topic, because the police topic always gets me heated. But first, I want to give a little bit of a shout out to the Sonoma County Pride events, because I feel like it is a lot more like close to center, down home, community driven, and you still see floats with like grannies for gays and the queer liberation farmers and stuff. And if you look back at the early queer pride parades, um, like that was how it started without all the corporate sponsorship and like community members coming out and showing support and celebrating one another and finding closeness and common ground. And I really appreciate what we have going on in Sonoma County on that front. I definitely agree with the experiences you're talking about in San Francisco and the bigger city prides. I haven't been to one of those in maybe a decade because it's painful. But I think like generally I'm not, you know, an advocate for like, um, like censorship on the free market and stuff as long as there's not violence or problematic behavior involved. But I think that we should take these corporations money and then put a big old scorecard next to their ad in the gay pride program or as their float goes down say, oh, and here we have Safeway going by, they donated $56,000 to a Republican candidate who promoted anti-trans bill in the Senate and just make them stand burn it. <laughs> next to their actions. Yes, let them, if they're gonna come to these events let them face their own real behaviors and let it be a moment where it's publicized so that they don't get to have this fake polished costume they put on to float down the street in front of us and then go back into their hole where they do some really horrendous stuff. Some of these corporations, I can't even believe that they were, they even had the gall to come to Pride. <laughs> um, but like bring them in and just tell them up front, hey, yeah, great. You can totally have a, a float and a sponsorship banner but we're going to tell people how you have or have not supported our community or how you've actively harmed the community. Because that really, I think, is one of the best ways to get to accountability. Make them stand next to their scorecard. Mm -hmm. uh, this conversation reminds me a little bit about, um, God, I think it was in the late 90s or early 2000s, that there was sort of like a counter parade called Gay Shame, which you know it had some sort of like, 
weird problematic directions but it was just sort of like the response to the corporatization of gay pride and it wasn't about shame or anything so um but it was sort of like this anarchist rejection of rainbow capitalism early on and um it was a non-sanctioned street street fair that happened at the same time with no corporate sponsorships or anything and it was pretty cookie party while it lasted um all right so uh, police at Pride. The, the question that I always ask when this comes up is, what exactly needs to be policed at Pride? Like, why do we need to have police in uniform at Pride? We're not doing anything wrong. This is not illegal anymore. There's no reason for law enforcement. If there is any need for safety measures, hire an independent and progressively minded security firm to support that also is actually skilled in de-escalation so that problems that occur don't escalate or result in further violence. There are lots of alternatives to police presence at Pride. As far as, you know, like police feelings, you know, like the, 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 the uniform, the police uniform has been a symbol of oppression in our community and in all minority communities. But, you know, we talk about Stonewall, which was a riot against police oppression from a raid you know, like back to the assassination of Harvey Milk by the current police, that active co police chief during that time. So it's, there's a major conflict of interest here to like celebrate your police uniform at a parade that is the legacy of fighting against your oppression against our community and extreme violence in many cases against our community and our allied communities surrounding us. So I, it makes me think Sure, the police are ready to come peacefully to the Pride Parade and, and not shoot anyone in the face with rubber bullets and, and tear gas. Is but it? they certainly weren't showing up to the BLM parades last year without shooting people in the face with rubber bullets or throwing tear gas at them. So until they can figure out and clean their own house and show that they are supporting of minority communities, they don't really get to have a seat at the table. They don't get to come here and pretend like they're well-behaved at Pride and then go and and violently harm people in a, in a parade that essentially happens like in the same month now. So clean your own house first, I guess, is the statement I wanna make about that. And then we'll talk. Mm -hmm. So as long as um, people of color don't feel safe around a uniform, which, you know, like that's on the people in the uniform, not on the people of color, then there's no place for the uniform pride. Jesse, can yeah. I have one thought to the rainbow right. capitalism? Yeah. It was thought that those two were put together when they really were two completely separate topics. Um, from the rainbow capitalism, um, my 15 year old asked me about AIDS the other day. Hmm. And we had, and I gave her the whole, the whole shebang. And um, she just hadn't been given enough. So for me, pride um, is, it's, it's a parade, but a parade is a misleading word. Um, for me, it feels, um, I don't have a better word for almost um, a wake or funereal mm -hmm. procession. There is a, you know, I've lost count of how many people that were friends and family that have died from AIDS. And thankfully, um, younger queer people don't have the same understanding. They don't have that same feeling. But for me, it is, it's almost like going to church. This is the time to talk about what it means. This is the time to recognize those that we've lost. Um, this is a respectful thing. And I don't like it when Safeway shows up with their stupid balloons that make them look like some sort of corporate angel. I don't know what those things, they're really cool looking, but they annoy me because the chipper happiness that is sold by those corporations that everything's okay now and we love you the way you are and you're such, you're such a cute, sassy, gay best friend, right? The one that fits in the box. Um, but um, we're not talking about Black trans women. And we're not talking about their deaths. And we're not talking about all the people that are gone. Mm -hmm. I need some of that mm -hmm. in pride to balance it out. And we don't get to have that anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of the day that is bittersweet mm -hmm. and, and um, very grounded for me that it's getting further and further away from that. And the rainbow capitalism um, is disrespectful. 
I also, uh, earlier you mentioned that, um, like you don't deal with like police interaction treating you like a person, you know, uh, a person of color, but it's still there. Like mm. the, the thought is still there. The mindset of like, uh, you know, that they could, it just takes one mm -hmm. to interpret you in a certain way and then have all of those like same dangerous biases activate. Uh, it just takes one and we're dead. Um, like I don't deal with that much uh, when it comes to, to police. Like I definitely acknowledge that. Uh, I, I think that the like the reality of having like a different set of threats in like seasons is something to that that's like worth talking about. But also like even if they're not a threat to me, I interpret them as a threat, and that is not going to change. I think in my lifetime. Um, and I, if I have kids, I'm going to raise them to not trust police. Um, and, and so like, yeah, like there, there is not uh, a foreseeable future where cops uh, are in my mind anywhere near welcome at Pride. Uh, and then like just the, you know, thinking of like, what, why is it Pride? It, it's Pride because we weren't allowed on the streets out of the shadows into the streets, right? Like uh, in defiance of the laws that that didn't allow us to be there. It's not pride as in like happy <laughs> rainbows. It's pride as in like, you can't take me down. Mm. Uh, and I think that <laughs> needs to be remembered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, just so I just wanna echo, you know, how you all like in how you each talked about your own identity as this like very unique and personal and fluid thing. Like pride is also something that is ours, right? To eat that each and every one of us owns and decides what that looks like. And it's not corporations and it's not cops. Um, and it's not just, you know, rainbow logos. It's, it's really about what it means to each and every one of us. So thank you all so much for what you had to share on that. Um, so I'm going to transition a little bit into where we're getting, I know we're, we're wrapping up our amazing conversation here, but I wanted to mention, you know, we talked, we talked some about history. Ooh, Em, you look like you have something. I know. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to acknowledge one really quick thing because Carrie brought it up for me. Um, I've been, I've been watching a lot um, of shows. Um, if you haven't watched Pose, please watch Pose. Um, but uh, um the, the progress flag that has um, come to uh, kind of replace the, the traditional rainbow flag um, over recent years, um, uh, you're right in, in that pride is also kind of a mass grieving. Um, and just, uh, I want to acknowledge that um, the black stripe um, in the progress flag is for those living with HIV and AIDS and those that we've lost. Mm -hmm. And I think about that every single time that I see the flag. Mm -hmm. And it's not I- black stripe. Yeah, so I mean, on the on the one that we have for the logo for this one too, um, there's no brown stripe on there. Um, I did notice that, but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to point that one out. Um, yeah, and and visual symbolism is so important, and actions at the end of the day are what's most important, right? So absolutely. it's beautiful that we are being more inclusive in our imagery, and now it's time for the actions to back that up. And one way that we have um, actions to back that up in California is something called the FAIR Act. So we talked a bit about history earlier and how history, LGBTQ history isn't always taught or talked about. Um, and so the FAIR Act is about amending the California Education Code to include the fair, accurate, inclusive, and respectful references to contributions by people with disabilities and members of the LGBTQ community in both history and social studies curriculum. This um, act was put into effect in 2012, although those really, there's really no state level enforcement happening. And so it's really on the districts to decide to make these changes. And um, from what I understand, working in Sonoma County, many districts are not exactly in compliance with the FAIR Act. And so let's just discuss this and we're gonna start with you, Carrie. 
So I have taught K through 12. I'm a college um, instructor, a, a different title everywhere I go. Um, and I'm a lifelong teacher. And for the life of me, I haven't seen anything that looks like that anywhere ever. I'm one person, right? Um, my kid has gone through Santa Rosa City Schools. Nope, all of the education she gets on topics like that comes directly from me. Um, so I think it would be really important. I get 8 million communications from my kid's school every week. It's obscene. Um, but this one would be really, really nice as a parent to know that this A exists and B right? That it is a thing. Are they going to talk about it? No. So I don't know who can kick the can or push this ball, but I know parents don't know about this. And I know as parents are getting queerer, um, as they're right, as we're who we are. And the fascinating thing about going through COVID-19 and shelter in place, um, if people hadn't looked at their mortality before or looked at the quality of their lives, they're doing it now um, or have been for the last year. So I'm fascinated to see where everybody ends up on their journey or you know what their next step is. Anyway, lots of marriages, relationships are changing, families are changing, and that revolves around school. So I know that families don't have this information. I'm not getting it as a parent. I definitely didn't get it as a teacher. So, um, and you go through teacher training as well. Um, we talk lots about mental health and violence and sexual assault and stuff like that, but we know this one doesn't come up. And um, so I think if there's a place that this can shift, it's that making sure that A, parents know about this, and then of course, queer and parents of color, right? So not just <laughs> the, the, not just the white families, but every school, every community needs that information so that the parents can pick up um, the mantle and fight for their kids to get inclusive um, information. I know um, there was a, a book that I had called Black is Brown is Tan. And it was a, it was a storybook, a drawn storybook of a white man and a black woman, which looked like my family. And I had never seen anybody ever that looked like my family, um, except for maybe like Blue's Clues. I don't know if you saw Blue's Clues, any of you, um, but they had um, a salt and pepper shaker that got married and had a baby named Cinnamon. Okay. So, episode right? Okay. So when we see ourselves in the media, when we see ourselves represented, there is nothing um, more um, esteem building or um, seeing yourself out in the world. So when you have children that are from um, a variety of backgrounds, and as a teacher, I often interact with the foster system, foster care system. Uh, so those parents aren't necessarily bio parents. They're often grandparents. They're fan so I'm not using mom and dad. I'm using, you know, family members. I'm, I'm using a variety of words. So our educational systems are not doing that as well as they could. Uh, but I know if we get that information into the hands of parents and families, particularly those of color and those that are queer, right? We bundle those together and then we have to work with the allies as well, right? Those two pieces, but it's always about information. And then what can you do to make a difference? Mm -hmm. That would be my practical approach to this. Um, that's how I would move it forward if it was up to me. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carrie. And I did, we did just share a link in the chat. Um, it's a, an excellent website all about the FAIR Act, including lesson plans. And that's done through our family coalition, which was, I think, really instrumental in getting the FAIR Act passed. And Johnny, anything you want to weigh in on this one? Um, yeah, I actually am not very informed about this topic, but I, I will say that if you, if anybody wants to help make change in the community and you don't know where to start, start by calling representatives on the local, state, national level. Um, sometimes I feel like being old and being an activist means I call Dion Feinstein like every week. And I, I, you know, that, that old right-leaning centrist who seems to have been our senator for like a hundred years has had to shift her opinion many times when um, members of our community flood her office with calls and emails and physical snail mail, like to push her to a progressive topic. 
it does work. Politicians, their job is to get reelected in their minds and to get reelected, they need the support of people. So when we make our voices heard, change really does happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know as much about the school system. Um, I'm a gay dude with no kids. So I'll <laughs> defer to you, Carrie, on how who we would get in touch with to start putting the pressure on. But I also helped tutor my nephew a little bit this summer during the um, remote learning and he struggled with that atmosphere. And I was appalled at the representation of the history of California and the Native Americans. I felt like it had regressed since I learned it way, way back in the day. And so definitely I would love to help push some progressive shift in the curriculum that our community's children are experiencing. Tell, tell your gay friends that have kids, if you have any. Start at the, start at the couch. That's how we get it out. Get people all riled up and they go, what? They go, your kids. And they'll be like, oh, I'm on it. Yeah. Bring the kids in. Everybody will do it. Just well, since we're talking about education, and I know very little about the like education political struggle, but uh, just like as, you know, for, for folks out there, like find your own. Like also like, I mean, yes, let's get it into the schools, but also like, uh, I don't trust the school system to really dig into queer history and do it justice. Uh, it will be better to have some, but also find your own <laughs> and, and continue to like educate people in your, you know, your, your circles uh, with the things that you find, not the things that are in textbooks. Absolutely. I think, I think, oh, yeah, I think the hope with it too is that, you know, I I think about I think about my own experience with it too in not uh, you know, the, there was never any sort of um queer education um that I got. Um I didn't realize um some of the things that I was feeling were were things that had labels. Um until I had to dive and do my own, my do my own, God, <laughs> I had to do my own research. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, exactly. having, not even having like a base word, I didn't know the word gay existed um, for much too long, in my opinion. And uh, not having, not having heard it in any sort of school setting, um, I, um, it really just pushed me to, to kind of educate myself, but that shouldn't be the only way. Um, I agree that I don't think that they will, um, do it properly. Um, I, I have hopes for future teachers, but, um, fingers crossed mm -hmm. until we're all working on it. <laughs> And I just very quickly want to plug um, LGBTQ Connection is part of something called the LGBTQIA plus coalition that I started a few months ago that is 15 different local LGBTQ organizations coming together to push forward things like compliance with the FAIR Act. I'm adding a um, member directory to that to the chat here, which has all of the different contacts for the different LGBTQ orgs in the county. And you can reach out to any one of us um, if you want to be more involved in things like advocacy or on the FAIR Act. It's definitely something that we're going to be focusing on. Um, and I know we are in our last few minutes here. So I just want to, first of all, thank all of you. This has been an incredible conversation. And to close, do any of y'all just have any kind of short and sweet advice for any young people who are just starting out exploring their identity? I got something I can throw out real quick. Um, it's scary at first, but don't worry because being queer is super awesome. So <laughs> go, ahead and, go ahead and explore it. Um, uh, figure out what who you are and what you like and what's going on with you. And remember also, like I sort of started with, identity is impermanence. So you don't have to get it right the first time. Nobody gets to check you on if you're accurate or precise about it get in there and explore what it's like to be one thing. And if it's not fitting right, try a different one. Like that's what freedom is about is freedom of identity. And same to older folks. Cis heteronormativity is fake. Uh, <laughs> experiment, try things. Uh, don't limit yourself to uh, the, the script that has been, been put in place for you. Uh, at some point in time, like 
are, are humans limited the possibilities of what it means to be human? Don't. <laughs> Don't participate in that. So if I've got one sentence, it, um, okay. it feels really scary right now, but there are no gender or rules other than consent about, about sex. There are no rules other than consent. Um, one last one. Um, <laughs> uh, parents, um, there doesn't have to be a closet. Your kids don't have to come out. Uh, and if they, there doesn't have to be a closet that your kids have to come out of, make it an accepting space. Let them know, verbally say it. What will you do if your kid comes out? Think about what you will say. Excellent. Wow, right on time, look at that. Sorry to the audience that we did not get to any questions tonight, but this has been an incredible conversation. Um, I'm, I'm always available to answer questions. Jesse at lgbtqconnection.org. Sarah, uh, Katie, feel free to put that in the chat as well. And just thank you so much to all four of you. You're all incredible. You have, you brought so much to this conversation. Um, it's a big conversation, always more to say, but, but thank you so much. It's been an honor to hold this space with you all. Thank you. Thanks for hosting, Jesse. You've been amazing. Thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Be fabulous and queer. <laughs> <laughs>